welcome to the Mindful Healers podcast with Dr. Jesse Mahoney and Dr. Ni Cheng Liang. We are here to help you learn to pause and be present, awaken your breath, and harness the ripple effects of mindfulness for radiant health. We get you. We know you. We are you. We have both been successful on the surface, yet struggling underneath. We have both had cluttered brains, been overwhelmed, and exhausted. We are healers who have found solutions and want to share them with you. Join us here to discover a better way. Welcome to a special episode for the Mindful Healers podcast on teens and mindfulness. A reminder that this is not to be construed as medical advice. Today, we have a special guest with us, a heartfelt welcome to Dr. Zoom Vo, who is a pediatrician specializing in adolescent medicine. He's the founding director of the British Columbia Children's Hospital Center for Mindfulness and is a clinical associate professor and division head for the Division of Adolescent Health and Medicine, Department of Pediatrics at British Columbia Children's Hospital and the University of British Columbia Faculty of Medicine in Vancouver, Canada. He is also the author of The Mindful Teen, Powerful Skills to Help You Handle Stress One Moment at a Time. Welcome, Zoom. Thanks so much for being with us. Hi, guys. It's really lovely to see you. Um, yeah, thanks for having me. And, and I just want to acknowledge uh, I'm on the unceded traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil First Nations, which is now known as Vancouver, British Columbia, but has uh, been inhabited by our First Nations forebears for uh, millennia. Thank you so much for acknowledging that. Our intention for today's podcast is to shed light on the other pandemic that's going on related to the viral pandemic, the dramatic rise in mental health challenges of our youth and specifically in adolescence today. We hope that you will discover how mindfulness can be used to help teens navigate the challenges of all the life stressors. Some of the takeaways from today's podcast that mental health issues with rates of mood disorders and suicide related outcomes are significantly on the rise amongst adolescents and young adults. And we hope to send you home with some easy tips to try for yourselves and to share with your teens in your life, whether they're family members or patients. Thanks so much for being here, Zoom. I'm going to start with a question. Yeah. So having experienced this other epidemic in my own household, having a preteen and hearing about other friends, children's facing very similar increases in anxiety and depression. What's been your experience with mental health challenges experienced by your adolescent patients and students? Uh, in adolescent medicine, both in Canada, as well as when I hear from my colleagues in the United States and worldwide, the biggest challenge that we're facing is the uh, dramatic rise of adolescents uh, with eating disorders. Uh, and we're calling this the shadow pandemic. And it's really skyrocketed um, throughout Canada, throughout the United States, uh, our colleagues in Australia and the UK are also reporting the same thing. Uh, so uh, our eating disorder services are really overwhelmed. Uh, the number of patients who are presenting uh, is way, way higher in the range of 150 to 200 percent higher in many cases. Uh, and not only that, but they're presenting much sicker than they were before. Uh, they're both much sicker medically. Uh, requiring much more intensive medical stabilization. They're also much sicker psychiatrically, uh, and they're also presenting later because uh, they're not being um, treated and diagnosed and cared for as early, so the, the illness is much bigger. So that's, I'd say, the main thing that we're seeing. We are also seeing uh, rising rates of overdoses, and unfortunately in British Columbia, uh, opioid overdoses is the number one cause of death for teenagers, uh, at least in the top three. Our data is not really clear, but quite likely the number one cause of death. And in, in 2021, we had a record year with 29 deaths of young people under 19 of opioid overdoses. And so we're really seeing the effects of that too. So it's tragedy. Why do you think this is happening? I, you know, I, I don't think there's probably one single cause. And unfortunately, we're never going to have the perfect research to show you know, a double blind placebo controlled trial showing what the cause is. But anecdotally, what parents and teens tell me 
uh, certainly living under a pandemic is extremely stressful. Uh, they're also telling me that they have loss of routines and loss of connection. Uh, I think the issues around in-person versus remote schooling is highly controversial. Uh, there's not a lot of great research on that, um, but certainly for some young people, at least, school is a protective factor. Uh, and and when they are not able to go to school, they lose that. And it's not to say that, you know, lack of school is causing suicidality or anything like that. It's certainly, I don't think that's simple. Uh, but I've definitely had young people tell me, uh, I had one young person who's 18, and he's uh, having uh, a lot of stress at home because his family is not accepting of his uh, sexual orientation. And he said, when I couldn't go to school, I was just miserable. I just locked myself in my room at home. I couldn't think, I couldn't do anything. Uh, and now that I'm back in school, I have at least two adults that I can talk to that I know who care for me. Uh, and, and he's doing much better uh, now that he's back in in-person school. Um, now, certainly there are some kids where school is a big stressor and they're, they're bullied and harassed because of their sexual orientation or their race or their gender. So I, I think it's complicated. Uh, but I think school has something to do with it, and it can go both ways. Uh, certainly parents and families are stressed as well. Um, they're, they're losing a lot of their extracurricular activities too. Uh, so I think, I think there's probably a lot of reasons to it, but living in a pandemic for two years, I mean, this is a huge chunk of their adolescence, uh, which is a really key developmental time period. So they've, they've lost a lot. And, and I would also say young people have borne the brunt of the pandemic in many ways, young people and the elderly, the young people have been asked to sacrifice a lot in order to protect the adults. And, and I think it's time that we prioritize the young people. I really appreciate that thought about the loss of connection in particular, because I think um, I have young people in my life. So I have a 26 year old, a almost 22 year old and a 16 year old. And I think for them, I would say that it is really that loss of connection to peers and, you know, for those of us who are older, being at home together maybe felt like much more of a gift than it did to them. And they do feel like, you know, one has lost half of his college to COVID or actually a bit more. He's graduating this year and um, just completely changed his entire college experience. And one missed a Peace Corps opportunity that was canceled. And so, you know, they've, they've moved on and adapted, but that, um, connection to peers and connection to place and connection to adventure. And uh, it's interesting because I was trying to think, as you said that, well, how can mindfulness compensate for it? And I don't think it can, honestly, can't change it. Can certainly help how you um, experience it. But uh, as I was thinking about the topic of the podcast, my mind went to, well, mindfulness can't fix that. And I think we often talk a bit about how we you know, bring mindfulness in in these conversations, but it can only change our experience of what's happening and allowing them to have that grief and that anger. And I will say, actually, and I, I'm realizing this moment, I'm a little bit guilty that I get a little frustrated with their anger about it. And, you know, I'm just thinking like, oh, but, but allowing that and letting them process it and appreciate it, even if it, in the long game of life, it's only two years, right? In their schema of life, it's very significant and very important. And they were sort of critical, you know, from the pediatric perspective, critical developmental years of independence and, and those sorts of things that they have really um, missed out on. It makes me think though, yesterday I was at a baseball game with my sons and a, a parent said, well, so essentially she's letting her senior in high school do whatever he wants because he hasn't been able to be out. And I thought, huh, I wonder if that's the answer. Like, so, and I, it all is coming from this very compassionate space. We want to help, but I think there's, um, you know, reactions to what happened and impact of what happened. And so it feels like a very swirly intense spot for our young people right now. How can yeah. we help Zoom? What's that? How can we help? Oh, goodness. Uh, well, I mean, I think just to comment on, on what Jesse said about this connectedness and, and the developmental task uh, and the developmental time frame, I think it's really important for adults to recognize what are the key developmental tasks of adolescents. Just like a one-year-old or a two-year-old, they need to learn how to walk, they need to learn how to talk. So for adolescents, the key developmental task is identity development. It's figuring out who, I, who am I and where do I fit in? 
And connectedness is a key protective factor. And that's been shown in decades and decades of research that connectedness can buffer a lot of adversity. And that's school connectedness, uh, that's peer connectedness, uh, and that's family connectedness. So it's it's all three of those. And the school connectedness and the peer connectedness has, has really suffered. And I think it's really affected their identity development. So uh, I'm really glad that um, you mentioned that, Jesse. We got to really protect what's important for adolescents' identity development, which is a really key window of life. Um, in terms of how we can help, I mean, I also agree with what you said, Jesse. Mindfulness is not going to fix this. Um, you know, it's not a cure-all. It's not a panacea. Um, but certainly, it can help. Uh, it can help us to, to get through these hard times. And when we think of con connectedness and mindfulness, one of the things that I've really been moving towards in my own way of teaching and practicing mindfulness, uh, and I learned this from Zen Master Thich Nhat Hanh, who's my teacher, um, is that mindfulness is not an individual affair. Mindfulness is a community practice. Uh, it is a connected practice. And I really believe that the next wave of, you know, what we call secular mindfulness or mindfulness in medicine, mindfulness in the West, uh, is really going to be about community mindfulness. Uh, it's really going to be about interpersonal mindfulness and how can we wake up together. That's, that's the name of a, of a great book, uh, Wake Up, Waking Up Together. Um, so how can we be uh, mindful, collected in a collective way? Uh, and when it comes to teenagers, uh, that's really one of the things that I'm seeing in our own mindfulness course is that mindful uh, kids practicing mindfulness together uh, and building a mindful community uh, is really helping to, them to get through this hard time. First of all, I loved that you said the um, collective because you know we often talk about the mindful healthcare collective and the way we've tried to bring people together around this. And then my mind immediately went to thinking about my teenagers. I actually asked my 16 year old, I said, I'm gonna do this podcast on mindfulness and teens. Like, what do you think would be interesting to share? And he said, so, and I'll tell you, he um, actually has started practicing mindfulness, though his inspiration is athletic performance and that's what got him into it. So he's read about it. And so, but it's hilarious because he's now like practicing his breath work and he's practicing his meditating and he's doing his yoga. But what he said to me is, well, I'm kind of weird amongst my friends. Most of them wouldn't do it and they wouldn't, you know, it's not really cool. I'm trying to share it with them. And he told me how he shared it with one of his pitchers yesterday before the game, but it didn't really work. So he's like, I'm not sure he came on board yet. I thought it was pretty funny, but, but he was very clear that it's not necessarily sort of accepted in kids as a, as something to do that's, um, helpful or thought of as cool. So I'm sort of curious how you've seen teens come together um, to accept this and bring it into their usual life practice. Your, your example of, of your son is, is so great because uh, everyone comes to mindfulness in their own way based on what their own needs are. And so there's no one size fits all. And most of us, um, at least I'll speak for myself, I came to mindfulness uh, during a time of great suffering. I came to mindfulness because I needed it because I was in pain. And I think that's uh, true from the two of you as well, from what, from what I know about you. Um, so it's the same for teenagers. And so my experience with teenagers is I really wanna know what it is that's important to them. And sports is one example. So wanting to uh, you know, be able to cope with the demands and the pressures uh, of, of being an athlete. Uh, for other kids, it might be school. Uh, maybe they're having panic attacks when they sit down to take a test. Uh, for other kids, it might be arts. Uh, maybe they get uh, really anxious uh, when they're doing a performance uh, or if they're in the theater when they get up on stage. Uh, for other kids, it might be chronic illness. And as a pediatrician, I, I take care of a lot of young people with chronic pain and chronic illness. And those things can be really debilitating or overwhelming. Uh, and, and there are many other examples. So I really try to meet young people where they're at and see what's most important to you. And, and then how can mindfulness help? And then being authentic and telling really true stories about how mindfulness might play a role. And it's not a fix. It doesn't make that pain go away. It doesn't fix the illness. It doesn't make the anxiety disappear. It doesn't make the pain go away, any of that. Uh, but it can help us get through it. So often I will tell um, some stories from my own life or from other teens' lives. Um, and when teens start telling each other stories about how they're using mindfulness, those are the most powerful moments. And in my mindfulness course, uh, when that's happening, 
and teenagers are telling other teenagers about how they're using mindfulness for really challenging situations in their own life, at school, uh, and at home, in the family, uh, then uh, that's really where the magic happens. And I really see my job as kind of getting out of the way and letting them teach each other because that's some really powerful learning. And it takes time too. So that's the other thing. So your, your son telling their teammate about it you know, it might not be one time that's like, oh, yeah, sure, I'm going to go meditate now. It doesn't really work like that, but it's often planting seeds. And when teens hear it from one friend and they hear it from another, and then they see their, their parents or adults that they respect actually using and practicing and embodying mindfulness uh, to get through difficult times, uh, then maybe they start getting interested. And then when the time is right for them, when they're having a hard time, uh, those seeds are there and they're ready to to sprout. And, and that was my experience. So uh, when I was a teenager, uh, those seeds were planted largely by my father. Uh, but I'll be honest with you guys, I was not interested in it when my dad was telling me to try this when I was 14 years old. Uh, and he was telling me about Thich Nhat Hanh when I was 14 years old. I wasn't interested when I was 14. Uh, but those seeds were planted. And then by the time I got to 17 to 19 to 20, uh, and I really started going through some hard times, and I was looking for some way to cope and handle that, those seeds were there and I was ready for it. Uh, so there's always a value in planting seeds when it's authentic, when it's planted with love, not when it's planted with this idea of you go do this and you go fix yourself. You know, you go do this so I don't have to deal with your anger. Like that's probably not going to be so helpful. Um, but if it's, you know, I love you and this is something that helps me and, and I hope that it might be able to help you. I think those seeds can be very powerful. You mentioned just the modeling of parents too. And so that is something that we can do as adults and not, not just parents, but any adults. If we model practicing mindfulness and showing up mindfully, they are watching. Oh, absolutely. Um, that's one of the most important things that adults can do to help young people. Uh, one of my mentors in adolescent medicine, his name is Dr. Ken Ginsberg. Uh, he's at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and the University of Pennsylvania. And he taught me that what adults do is way, way more important than what adults say. And that teenagers watch closely what adults do. And if adults say things that they are not doing, then the message actually backfires. So if an adult, whether it's a parent or a doctor or a counselor or a teacher, if they say to a teenager, hey, you should go meditate, you should you know, ex approach this problem with some mindfulness, but the teenager says the adult is not doing that, then the message totally uh, backfires and it's perceived, I think rightfully so, as hypocritical and disrespectful. Uh, on the other hand, if an adult doesn't say, hey, go meditate, but the teenager sees that the adult is using that in their life and it's helping them to be a calmer person, a more stable person, a more resilient person, then, th then that actually is a much more powerful message than anything the, the adult can say. And again, that was true in my own life. When I look at the, the reasons that I got interested in mindfulness, it wasn't because of anything anyone said. It was because I had, I saw some people in my life and I saw how they were able to stay stable. They were able to have this calm, loving presence, even when things were really challenging. Uh, and, and I thought, you know, whatever it is that you are doing, I want to do that. You know, however it is that you are able to do that, I want to learn how to do that too. That was what inspired me. And it's the same for our kids. And they tell it like they see it. So uh, teenagers in particular. Yeah, yeah, they have, I call it a BS meter. They know <laughs> when adults are BSing them, you know, telling them do as I say, not as I do. Um, take my advice, I'm not using it. Like that's the message that teenagers get. And they get that so often, let's be honest. They get that so often in their lives. Um, adults telling them, hey, don't use your phone so much. Uh, but then the adults themselves are, you know, on their phone, checking their messages at the dinner table. Uh, you know, I hear that story over and over and over. Uh, so uh, adults really need to model uh, what they're doing. And then when it comes to something like mindfulness, this gets back to that interpersonal mindfulness. And, you know, it goes back to the work of people like Dan Siegel and interpersonal neurobiology and, and all everything we know about mirror neurons and the neurobiology. Uh, the brain is not individual. The brain is a social organ. And so when one person is mindful, it actually transmits that energy to the people nearby. 
And, and same with when one person's angry or one person's irritable or one person's depressed. And you can see that in your own life. It doesn't take MRIs to show that. When you're around someone who's stressed or anxious or angry, you're going to feel that. Uh, or when you're around someone who's, who's stable, who's peaceful, who's happy, who's calm, um, you're going to feel that too. And, and like I said, that's how I learned when I was around people like that, uh, in particular, Thich Nhat Hanh, but there were other people as well. When I was around that, I felt different. My neurons changed. And that was a light bulb moment. It's like, whatever's happening, I want to learn that. So if I may, I'm going to distill down the important key points that this conversation has, has exemplified. Um, so show, don't tell. Yes. Model mindfulness and um, healthy behaviors. And then the sharing of stories as a means of connection, mm. also as a way of modeling. And then everyone comes to mindfulness in their own time. Yeah, it, it can't be forced. And not that this is only pertinent to teens, but I think these are powerful messages and powerful truths for adults in general as well. Yeah, and I think these really challenge our usual ways of knowing as well. So as physicians, you know, we're trained in the scientific method and we're trained in evidence-based medicine. But a lot of what I'm talking about is actually very hard to study with our traditional scientific methods. I mean, how do you study this idea of planting seeds, you know, and, and that the seeds can sprout years later? Like that's a very hard study to do. Uh, and then also ways of knowing, like stories. I mean, our cultures around the world, especially um, especially indigenous cultures, have long prized stories as really deep ways of knowing wisdom. Uh, and, and I think our scientific community can learn from that as well. Uh, so we have to change uh, a little bit about the way that we, uh, that we think we know things too, and the way that we can share things as well. I wanted to switch gears a little bit and talk um, a bit more about your book. Yeah. And that um, just all of the stressors from the pandemic and the stressors of just being a teen with changes in hormones related to puberty, different peer and academic and family pressures. You offered an acronym as part of uh, the book called the Sober Breathing Space for Encountering Anger. Can you tell us about it and how to use it? Yeah, so the sober breathing space, uh, we actually borrowed this from mindfulness-based relapse prevention, which is a mindfulness-based intervention developed by uh, colleagues like Sarah Bowen and, and some of her colleagues. Uh, and MBRP is really about helping people use mindfulness to deal with urges to use substances. Uh, so it's a kind of a substance use relapse prevention program. Uh, but it's super applicable to teenagers too, because often teenagers have these urges to react and to behave. And we know that developmentally, we can explain this neurobiologically because there's this mismatch in uh, brain development of the different brain regions, uh, the limbic areas and the prefrontal cortex. Uh, so they're, they're more vulnerable to, um, to acting on these urges. And that's normal and developmentally appropriate, and there's nothing wrong with that. But what we can teach them is uh, skills like the sober breathing space to help recognize those urges, to get out of autopilot, to bring presence, uh, and then to respond in a mindful way, to choose their response rather than being overwhelmed by those urges. And so the sober acronym stands for STOP. That means get out of autopilot, stop what you are about to do, stop what you are doing, always observe, uh, observe what's happening right now inside me, my, my body, my emotions, my thoughts. And then B is for breathe. Uh, so that means uh, really a narrow focus of awareness. And we can imagine it's like an hourglass. So stop and observe our wide awareness. Uh, and then B is getting into that middle part of the hourglass where we have a narrow focus on just the breath as best we can. It doesn't mean that the breath stays there, but it goes and comes back. And then E is for expand, a wide awareness again, but noticing what's different. And then R is for responding. That means choosing our reaction, choosing how we behave uh, rather than just doing what that immediate urge was. And, and that whole practice can take anywhere from you know, 30 seconds to, to three minutes, uh, and it can be done anytime, anywhere. So it's a, it's a really useful practical skill uh, in a hard moment, whether it's related to 
you know, urges to use substances or uh, anger, urges to say or do something that could hurt yourself or, or someone else. I'm looking forward to you leading the sober breathing space for us during our mindful moment. Sure. Tell us a little bit more about your book. Who is it intended for? Is it intended for the teens themselves, the parents? I'm going to, full disclosure, I haven't read it yet. So um, I'm looking forward to reading it. But I think our listeners will um, be interested in knowing more about who it's intended for and what's the message. It's written for teenagers specifically. And it comes out of uh, the program that I co-developed with Dr. Jake Locke, my colleague at BC Children's Hospital called Mars A, Mindful Awareness and Resilient Skills for Adolescents. Uh, so this is an eight week course for teenagers with psychological distress, anxiety, or depression with or without co-occurring chronic health conditions or chronic pain. And the Mindful Teen is basically the curriculum in teen friend friendly language. Uh, and literally how I wrote it was I recorded myself uh, as if I was teaching a Mars course and the Mars course had been going on for about three or four years at this time. So we had the curriculum. So I basically dictated it uh, and then turned it into a book. So that, that's basically how it came about. And at the time that I wrote it, uh, there were very few books directly written for teenagers in teen friendly language that were um, not Buddhist specifically uh, because I wanted to reach everyone. And that's not to say that um, I, I don't want to uh, give full credit to the cultural origins of mindfulness. I think that's important to do as well. And I learned from Thich Nhat Hanh uh, and so did John Kabat-Zinn for that matter. Uh, so uh, there is a history here uh, and we can acknowledge that, uh, but it's also, you don't have to be Buddhist to benefit from it. And so that's one of the messages. But the main message really is that mindfulness is for everyone uh, and that it is a, a, a way of life uh, and that it has very practical applications. And I try to have a lot of teen voices and stories. We talk about stories again. So there are several sections where teens are telling their own stories in their own words about how they're using mindfulness. Uh, so that's my main audience. Uh, but that said, uh, I've certainly heard from many adults who have said that they've read it uh, and really enjoyed it as well. And I've also heard from uh, families, both teens and uh, parents and caregivers who say they read it together. And that really, Kind of touches me when I hear that. Uh, when I first heard it, I, I was a bit surprised. I didn't think that, you know, a 14-year-old or 15-year-old would want to be read to by their parents. But for some teenagers and some parents, it depends on the families, so certainly not for everybody. But when it works, it's, it's actually quite nice. It's a way of teenagers and parents learning together. And again, it, it, it shows that the, t the parent is also learning. They're also practicing. It's not just something, oh, hey, hey, uh, son or daughter, read this and, and fix yourself. It's like, let's explore this together. Uh, let's be curious together. Uh, and, and it becomes a, a family practice, which is really beautiful. Oh, and then I wanna also brag a little bit. Um, so it's translated into Vietnamese as well. Um, so for me, this is coming full circle because uh, that's how I learned it is through my Vietnamese Buddhist family and culture uh, and people like Thich Nhat Hanh. And so now it's, it's uh, being offered uh, back to uh, teenagers in Vietnam. So that's really rewarding too. But uh, of course, the first language is English and full disclosure, I don't actually speak and read Vietnamese, sadly, um, but, I'm, but I'm glad it's uh, being offered there. That's a beautiful full circle for you. Yi Cheng, you were gonna read us and I really wanna hear them, some of the accolades of this book. And then I have a question about, um, I just have a thought about it, but I really wanna hear those as we're on the topic of the book. Yes, speaking of John Kabat-Zinn and Thich Nhat Hanh, um, the, the testimonials on the back of the book by John Kabat-Zinn here uh, reads, a book that establishes a truly wise, empathic, and motivating resonance with teens. It offers a straightforward and commonsensical way to deal with stress of all kinds and afflictive emotions and thoughts by inviting them into awareness and discovering that with a little mindfulness and heartfulness, you are much, much bigger than they are. And then um, by Thich Nhat Hanh, I highly recommend this book for teens and teen educators. So congratulations on, on, on those testimonials and accolades. Yeah, it was a big honor. I've learned so much for the two of them. So I'm very grateful that they supported this work. It's really fun. And I, I have a thought, and maybe it's my optimism coming forth, but we know that teens are struggling and suffering so much. And you mentioned early on that 
that's when they reached mindfulness. And so I'm thinking that maybe this is an opportunity. And I often um, work with parents who are really anxious about kids going through something really stressful and the, in, the negative impact for has, uh, having a parent with a mental health struggle and saying, well, actually going through something difficult as a teen is a way to develop new and interesting skills and to grow and to become much more resilient. And so it occurs to me here that this is sort of an opportunity for a generation to come to mindfulness early in life and have it become more of a part of who they are unfortunately, because they need it, which, but since, as, as we pointed out, since we're here and that's where we are, it seems to me a way potentially to, um, to really grow mindfulness. Yeah, absolutely. I think every time of suffering, uh, every illness, uh, everything that's going on in the world certainly is an opportunity. And Thich Nhat Hanh has this saying, no mud, no lotus. That means the lotus flowers grow out of the mud lotus flowers of mindfulness grow out of the mud of suffering. And, and that's actually how he developed his practice was during the war uh, in Vietnam. And in, in Vietnamese, they call it the American War, and Americans call it the Vietnam War. That's how his mindfulness practice. And we're in a time like that now. And, and I see that young people uh, are very aware of climate change. They're very aware of racial justice and social justice. Uh, and, you know, just now we're in a time of war in Europe, like the likes that we haven't seen in, you know, 70 years. Uh, so these are real tragedies, uh, but they're also opportunities for us to wake up together. And these are not problems that are going to be solved by individuals either. So that's why uh, I really love this idea of mindful community and waking up together. And I've certainly seen that. And on the individual level, I see some of the young people that I've worked with who come to mindfulness during a time of pain, chronic illness. Um, I first started teaching them about 12 years ago, and now some of them are leaders in their own right. They're young adults who are advocates, uh, who are go going into grad school, or who are raising awareness for health and mental health. They're writing about mindfulness. They're teaching others. Uh, and it's because they had these experiences where they came to it or when they needed to, when it really helped them and now they're teaching others. So it, it absolutely is an opportunity. And it certainly doesn't mean that I would wish any more suffering on people. We have more than enough, but when we have the suffering, can we make wise use of it? And that's a question that Thich Nhat Hanh always asks us. When we have the suffering, can we make wise use of it? And, and that's really what a practitioner is. It's being aware of the suffering and transforming it into awakening love and compassion uh, rather than avoiding it pretending it's not there, denying it, covering it up, which is frankly, that's what our society teaches people to do. It's like, let's cover it up. Let's just spend more time on Instagram or on TV or, or using substances. Um, and those are the things that get teenagers into trouble. And, and then I end up seeing them with, with the health consequences of that. Um, but there are other ways and, and it's a tremendous opportunity for young people. Well, we wanna thank you so much for taking your time and speaking with us today. Is there anything else that you'd like to share with our listeners? Uh, no, I, I just like to um, to thank you guys for for having this time. I, I guess one other thing I would share, uh, which has really been on my mind lately with mindfulness, a lot of the work in mindfulness, um, especially as it's gotten popular in the popular culture, not only has it focused on individualism rather than community, um, but it, I think it's also focused a lot on in attention and concentration, um, which is a part of it but it hasn't focused as much until recently uh, on compassion, love, and, and the ethical dimension of mindfulness. Uh, and for me, the way I learned mindfulness, uh, ethics, love, and compassion were an inherent part of it. It wasn't just bare attention. It wasn't only paying attention to how my breath feels or paying attention to how my body feels. That's a part of it, but it's also paying attention to how my breath and body feels with love, and then extending that to the people around me. And so I would really encourage us to uh, consider both community as well as ethics and compassion and love as really inherent qualities of, of mindfulness. Thank you. you mentioned that in the session you did um, for the Mindful Healthcare Collective, and it really resonated with me that this idea, you used a more eloquent word, but that love is not fluff, um, that it's a animated 
force or something to that effect. And I think that's really, uh, in my experience, very, very true. And that we can use it. I often talk about using it as a strategy or using it because that resonates with people, but it's, but it is something that we, if you think in culturally about what we do in the world from a place of love, that's where our strongest um, and most powerful and most influential actions come from. And so I, the reason I think I bring that up is that um, I'm often trying to figure out with teens, like how to get them to do something or encourage something. So if it feels like a powerful tool or a way, strategy, then they're a little bit more willing to take it in. And I think we often say, you know, tell them what they want to hear and then give them what they need to hear. And so it strikes me a little bit as maybe that's the draw for getting teens into mindfulness yeah. a bit. It has to come from that place. Yes. Yeah. Sharon Salzberg mentions love is an ability. And so maybe we infuse mindfulness more intentionally with love the way it was meant to be. I agree with that. Yeah. And then Val Hook says love is a choice. It's an intention. It's something that we choose to do. It's not a feeling that overcomes us, you know, with out of our control, but it's something that we, we choose. Sounds like we have another podcast here. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. The other podcast I would love to do with you someday is um, talking more about mindful hospitals. I'm reminded from this conversation, because I know that that's a passion of yours and how um, we can bring mindfulness into the practice of medicine, I think is such a beautiful thing and healing for both healers and patients. And so I would love to explore that conversation on another day as well. Absolutely. Yeah, we, we all need it and we, we all can practice together. It's not just for teens or for parents or for health professionals, it's for all of us. As always, we like to close our podcasts with some reflection questions for you, dear listener. How might the teen or teens in your life benefit from mindfulness? And how might you introduce mindfulness to them? How can you model mindfulness for them? And what stories about mindfulness can you share? And perhaps mindfulness is a practice that the two of you or your family could participate in together. Please help us spread the ripple effects of mindfulness for healers far and wide by following our podcast and leaving us stars and reviews. We thank you so much for your support. And if you work in healthcare and aren't already a part of the Mindful Healthcare Collective, we would love to have you join us at our Facebook group of the same name or through our email list at the mindfulhealthcarecollective.com. Links for those will be in the show notes. Please stay on after the sound of the singing bowl for our special mindful moment offering led today by Dr. Zungo. As always, if you want to declutter your mind, be more present and start truly living your one wild and precious life, come find us at the mindfulhealerspodcast.com. Work with one of us work with both of us start or up level your mindfulness practice discover how mindful coaching can change your life or even better do both as part of our mindful healers programs and retreats you can find links to find out more about our programs and join our communities at the mindfulhealerspodcast.com reach out and get started on your journey to a life better lived today the content of this podcast is not meant to be medical or life advice. If you choose to participate in our mindful moments, please do so safely. So I'll invite this bell to sound. This bell is the voice of our friend calling us to our true home, which is right here, right now. And we'll practice the sober breathing space. As the sound of the bell fades away, we can simply stop. Stop what we were doing. Stop what we were about to do. Stop doing and just allowing ourselves to be just as we are. O is for observing. Observing what's happening right now without any judgment, allowing it to be here. Observing, first of all, our body. What's happening in our body right now? 
Are there any signs of stress or tension or discomfort? Just noticing it, observing. Checking in with your emotions. What emotions are coming up for you? And can you give them names? Perhaps saying anxiety's here, worries here, anger's here, sadness is here. And just allowing it to be here since it's already here. There's no need to fight it. And observing where your thoughts are. Are you here in the present moment? Are you thinking about the future? Are you having memories or regrets about the past? Again, simply noticing what's happening. With the next breath, gathering our awareness. And then just breathing. B is for breathing. As best we can, bring our awareness just to the sensation of each breath. Breathing in, I know that I'm breathing in. Breathing out, I know that I'm breathing out. In. Out. E is for expanding. Expanding that awareness again to our whole body. How is your body feeling right now? Noticing if the sensations are the same or different than it was just a few minutes ago. Observing what emotions are present right now, in this very moment, without any judgment, and being curious, has anything changed? Observing where your thoughts are. Where is the mind? And then R is for responding. Choosing the next thing that we do, choosing our behavior, remembering what we care about, remembering the spirit of love and kindness and compassion, and choosing our behavior in a way that is kind and compassionate, first of our, all to ourselves, and then secondly to those around us, rather than uh, reacting, rather than maybe doing what that urge might have been originally. So that's the sober breathing space. Um, and I would invite you to carry on with the rest of your day uh, in that spirit of awareness and, and compassion as best you can. <laughs>